Hi, is everybody ready? So this week we're going to continue with looking at the work of Kandinsky, but he started to do a change in direction um, in the 1920s uh, where he became a little more geometric in his style of painting. He started off doing a lot of these improvisations, which were very organic and loose and unplanned. And then he went more into these geometric styles um, where there was definite circles and straight lines and so on. So this is one of his. Um, I've done this before with classes, with classes of kids and adults, and this is, it's kind of fun. So um, this is an example of one that I did where I had used masking fluid uh, to create outlines first, and this is a print. And the way I signed it, it can either be hung vertically or horizontally, and you can decide that later. Here's some student pieces from maybe high school or middle school. Now, what we're gonna be doing is looking at written instructions, step-by-step -step instructions. So this is gonna be a little more precise. You won't, you won't be um, as improvisational. Um, but even though the students all had exactly the same instructions, look at the variety of how they were interpreted. So you get sort of a general similarity, but much, um, much different in each person's approach. So originally this idea was to see uh, if the students could follow verbal instructions um, and see how their auditory uh, com comprehension was. But uh, since, since we're um, online, I'm gonna uh, put this on the Google Classroom and you can um, print it out and follow the instructions by reading it. But uh, the auditory one is kind of interesting. If you hear the sounds in the air and then you have to, you know, it's interesting how the human brain works, then you have to create visualizations or pictures in your head that match those words and see how, how it comes out. And my auditory comprehension really isn't that good. I'm much better at reading something and other people are better at hearing things. So either way, you have to go from words, which are left brain, into pictures, which are right brain. So in order to get started, you have to have a couple things, um, a ruler or some other kind of straight edge, and some circular objects to trace of different sizes. So we have all of these little lids and so on, or you could have a compass, but I, I think it's easier to just have something to trace. Um, you wanna have a piece of arches paper. I'm actually using a hot press or a, um, a flatter tooth of arches. Um, it's still 140 pounds, so it's the same weight, but it's got a smoother surface. And then you'll need a, a pencil and Probably a kneaded eraser or a squishy eraser is better. It won't damage your paper as much. And then once you have your design drawn, you're going to need to outline all the lines. Maybe erase the pencil line so it's not as obvious, but outline all the lines with something that will resist the watercolor. Um, the kids used crayons. This is an interesting kind of crayon called soft crayon. Soft crayons, so they're they're very soft, um, and then there's oil pastels. So both the wax in crayons and the oil and the oil pastels will resist the water of watercolor. Another option is a waterproof black pen. If you wanna just have black lines, um, you can also dip in India ink and use it that way, or you, if you wanted to have white lines, like the one I did, um, you can use masking fluid, dip a um, a calligraphy pen in masking fluid, or they have um, uh, masking fluid pens. This is by Pebo. Both of these are Pebo brand, and they seem to work pretty good. So you leave it on, then you paint over it, and then peel it off later, and it'll reveal the white of the paper, protect the white. What I think I'm gonna use this time is 
um, these acrylic markers, and the acrylic is waterproof, and these are uh, by Molotow, M-O-L-O-T-O-W, Molotow One For All Acrylic Paint Markers. So once they dry, they're waterproof. So we'll get to that later. That's after you've done your, your um, design, <clears throat> following the directions. Um, you're really gonna have to consider composition principles so that you wanna see if you can lead the viewer into an area of emphasis or a focal point. You don't wanna use every color, maybe have a limited palette to create unity. And, but at the same time, you don't want everything to be all the same. So you wanna have a little bit of variety, balance. It's a good idea to repeat colors for both balance and unity. And how are you gonna lead the viewer's eye to your focal point? Another thing I put on the Google Classroom is this little practice sheet. It was more for the kids. They might not have understood some of these words that were used in the instructions, so I had them just practice this. And just for fun, I said, copy the spiral and then draw something, turn the spiral into something like a snail or something else. Um, what, what are you going to turn the kidney bean into? It could be a little person that is kidney bean shape, a little cartoon character, etc. So um, how are you going to use a zigzag in a little drawing? So that's just for fun if you want to do it. Okay. And then of course, understanding color. You know, you need to understand what will happen if you use warm colors or cool colors or complementary colors. If you want an area to really stand out and it's got a yellow outline, maybe you could put purple over it to make it really pop or vice versa. Okay, so let's take a look at these instructions. It says draw lightly with pencil. So the first thing it says, using an object to trace, lightly draw a large circle anywhere on your paper. So that's kind of open-ended. I'm gonna start with a vertical format, but but later on, like I said, you can turn it. So what does large mean? This is definitely large, but in comparison to other circles, this could end up being large. So I'm gonna do something sort of moderately large. Let's actually, yeah, I think I'll actually use this as my large circle. So I don't know if I want it to be right on the corner, so maybe I'll do it maybe right about there, and I'll lightly trace it and create a quote unquote large circle. Now, if I was using a full sheet of watercolor paper, this might not be large enough. This might be what you'd have to use. Okay, so large circle anywhere on the paper. Inside the large circle, draw a smaller circle that touches the large circle at one point. Now remember, this really threw the kids off. So a smaller circle could be this, it could be this. Um, it could be this. So how is it gonna touch it at one point? I saw them doing, oh no, that's two points. Uh, that's no points. So, ah, one point is it's a tangent like this. I think that's the math, mathematical word. So it's touching at one point and it's inside, not outside. Okay, so there's that instructions. You have to really see what they're actually telling you to do. Using a ruler, draw a line that travels through the large circle and touches two different sides of the paper. Okay, so goes through the large circle. Now it doesn't say it goes through the small circle, but it doesn't say it can't. So. Are you gonna do this? So it's going through the large circle and touching two sides, uh, two different sides of the paper. So in other words, it has to go all the way from end to end somehow. I think I'm gonna do something like this. And I don't wanna go to the corner because that might lead the viewer's eye off the page. So I think I'll do this sort of a thing. And it's gotta go all the way across. Um, draw a line that is inside the large circle and touches two places on the edge of the circle. In other words, it goes all the way across the circle. 
So it's got to be inside. So I'm, I don't want it to go beyond the borders, but it's got to touch two places, two places. And it didn't say it couldn't go inside the small circle, so maybe that's what I'll do. I'll go, it's inside the large circle and it touches two places on the edge of the circle. Uh, draw a spiral anywhere and any size on your paper. So I go back and remember what a spiral is. Now notice that so far everything has uh, kind of created shapes or closed up areas. The spiral will be open-ended. It's just a continuous line. These are straight lines. This is a curved line, but it isn't closing anything up. So I could have a small spiral right here. I could have a small spiral inside this. I could have a giant spiral that goes like this. So let me think about it. Where is it going to start? Um, maybe I'll start it here. And I'll have it kind of wrap up right here. So there's all kinds of spirals, but that's that's what mine's going to look like. Um, draw three separate lines that start at any edge of the paper and bump the outer edge of the circle. Each line should stop at the circle edge. So maybe not go parallel, although it could be parallel. Could be a different angle. Let's try this. Starts at the outer edge of the paper and bumps up against the circle. Three separate lines. One, two, and how about, and I don't want to do a continuous, how about, I'm sort of leading the viewer into here. I keep going back to that, so stopping at the edge of the circle. Draw a kidney shape anywhere on the paper. So that kidney shape, um, remember, looks like this, sort of. And I can have a little one inside here. I can have a big one that encompasses everything. Or maybe, maybe I'll do a little kidney shape inside here. I don't love that, but I'll leave it. An oval or an ellipse anywhere on the paper. Um, anywhere. So it can, it can crisscross through some areas. Okay. I just want to have it bump up again. Um, draw a circle, ob use a circle object to trace a half circle on one of the straight lines. Hmm. So I only want to have half of a circle on one of the straight lines. Let's use something small and do a half circle. Now it didn't say I could only do one, so maybe I'll do another one. So that's what, something you wanna keep in mind when you're done with all the ins instructions. You can add some more things, as long as you have these as a minimum. So I have a couple of them right there. And maybe one more right here. There, I have some half circles. And draw a zigzag line between any two lines. So this is between two lines. This is between two lines here. Um, this is between two lines. I could have a really large zigzag. Um, let's try, let's try this. Okay. Maybe I'll do another one here. It doesn't say it has to touch the lines. It just says it has to be between the lines. So basically that's done. It says go over all your lines with crayons, think about your focal point and paint transparent watercolor washes 
over your crayon lines and shapes. Use similar and contrasting colors to emphasize or subordinate areas of your painting. So I'm going to go in and just kind of lift up that pencil so that um, it's just sort of a ghost image of it before I go over everything. And like I said, I'm going to try these um, uh, uh, acrylic markers. Uh, just to, to show you how all these different things work, this, I tried a couple acrylic markers and I painted over them to, just to make sure they were water repellent. So they are. Um, this is the masking fluid. Well, of course it's not going to work right now. Let me... So this is um, kind of like a resist. So I have to let that dry for a minute. Um, here is uh, a opaque or a waterproof pen like a sharpie this happens to be a pit sb or soft brush pen so that would give me a strong black line um, here is oil pastels and the oiliness will resist now i'm this is a, a cold press paper so you can see it's a little bumpier if I use, I'm using this hot press paper, it won't have as much tooth and the crayon might be a little less um, bumpy looking. And here's crayons. So I actually, believe it or not, the wax crayons seem to work better than the oil pastels I've found. So these are wax crayons or soft crayons, they're calling them. They may have a little oil in them for all I know. I don't know, I just used to use them a lot when the kids were really little because um, a lighter touch gave them a strong, uh, a strong line. And then just want to double check that they actually are water resistant. Here's, a, here's the acrylic pen. everything's dry before I do that. You can see how this is. See how that's pushing it away? So it's not going to go anywhere. This is not quite dry. And there's the acrylic marker, so that resists. I'm going to dry this paint right here. And some of you that have been with me know that we've used this um, white outline technique before and what you want to use is a rubber cement pickup for peeling away that masking fluid so you could end up with white outline okay so all of those are possibilities for how you're going to outline it but you don't want to just leave it in pencil okay so i'm Still thinking this may end up being my focal point right in here on this kidney edge where the spiral and the small circle is. So I have to start thinking about what colors 
I'm going to use. If I want this painting to be predominantly warm or predominantly cool, um, maybe I'll go with the majority of it being cool colors so that my outlines maybe should be warmer colors. And I also have a white pen. So, and you can leave some of the paper white. So let me go over the small circle. Of course, that's not gonna work here. Let's get another yellow. use these in a while. So I'm going over and I'm glad I erased a lot of that graphite so that it wasn't showing through as much this uh, very light color yellow. So let's try the orange. Now, even though this spiral is one line, I could actually change colors partway through the line. I could have changed colors on this line. have the rest of the circle be a different color. So maybe I'll do that. Oopsie. Here we go with acrylic. I pushed a little too hard. That's the thing about this. You can't erase it once it happens. So, there's no such thing as a mistake. Just make it look like the whole thing was supposed to be a thick line like that. I meant to do that. And here's my light blue. And now it's probably time to start repeating colors. Anyway, you can continue going over your your lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So once you do that, then you're ready to start thinking about uh, what colors you're going to paint it. And I forgot that was part of the spiral right here. There, it started right there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is put this aside now and just um, take an old one that I had been doing as a demo, I think, um, in a class at some point. And I'll continue with doing a little painting here now. Um, so you probably saw this demonstration of the different kinds of washes. So you're 
you're going to think about what kind of wash. So far, it looks like pretty much flat washes were done on this, although that was wet into wet a little bit. And now think about your color wheel and complementary colors, etc. Let's find our color wheel here. And if this, if I want this area to be my focal point or this area, I have to think about the background color. So if I if I want this to be the focal point, I could use a complementary color to paint over it, such as orange. Orange and blue are complementary colors. Um, and it's going to be a, another warm color, so they'll be similar. It might make this stand out more. Um, I could put, uh, I could start with a wet into wet. I could have orange here and then have it fade off into uh, red or a, a, a different color, wet into wet. Um, and so you have all this stuff to think about is what, how are you going to make your focal point stand out once you've decided what it is you want to be the focal point. Right now this wants to be the focal point. Um, I don't know if I could change it and make this end up being it, but let's try. Let's see if by putting orange on that, let's see what happens. So I'll start with this Scarlet Lake and put a pretty strong value over this whole area here. And now at some point here, it's like there's some white here. Oh, there's a white zigzag it looks like maybe in there. Well, maybe not. Now I'd like to start to do a graded wash here a bit. And this paper is pretty old, so it's resisting a little bit. Oh, there is a zigzag. There's something there underneath that's creating a texture. Oh, I like that. Don't ask me how it got there. <laughs> Maybe I'll do a little wet into wet and put some orange here too. I mean some yellow. Put a little permanent rose here also. So you can get kind of creative in how you're painting it. It doesn't have to be flat washes. Um, let's go with more of a cool permanent rose over here, just like that one was. Who knows what I did over here, too. Um, maybe I'll do some wet into wet here, too. I think this was school grade um, bit of watercolor paper. It's not arches, so it's it's kind of weird. But uh, and we'll put a little bit of blue in here to create a wet into wet purple. You can also take and do an area that's dry that's got a dry uh, area and paint a wash, a glaze, a transparent glaze over it so it shows the original color a little bit, but it's like laying a piece of stained glass on top of it. So 
go now. Taking a pointed brush. Graded wash here. Now, do I want to leave that white? Maybe not. That would be sort of the uh, bringing too much attention there. So I'll go back in and put a, a turquoise like I did on these little guys and fill that in. I don't know what this is. It's an accident, maybe, but it's kind of cool, whatever happened there. All right, so I think I'm done with this. Um, I would have to think about it more, but for demo purposes, you kind of know what, what to do then at this point. And once it's dry, you can always go back in and add more um, different textures. You could put uh, polka dots or something on top of this or more lines. As long as you put dark on top of light. So I'm sort of repeating that curve of the spiral. And maybe repeating it out here also if this was dry. Okay, so have fun with this project. I, I think that the longest thing will be really thinking about where you're gonna put all of the, the directives um, and then painting it is a whole nother decision-making process. All right, we'll talk to you soon.